Once again, I'm Ian. Um, I'm up in West Newbury, Vermont. Uh, I spent my life doing technical work in photography. The only job I had that might uh, be of interest to you is I used to run the photographic section for NASA's Langley Research Center down in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and hated it with a passion. I don't fit well with bureaucracy. <laughs> so I uh, left them and I've been mostly freelancing for the last 25 years or so now. Um, 2012, I realized that if I didn't get around to do the nature photography that I always dreamed of doing, I was going to run out of time. So I went out, made the investment, and investment is the right word. When I launched my kayak this morning to go see the loon, I was carrying something like $22,000 worth of camera gear. Um, <laughs> but so I've been doing wildlife since uh, 2011, I guess now. So, uh, and we're going to look at the puffins on Pachaya Seal Island, which is right in the mouth of the Bay of Fundy. Uh, I'll show you a map in a minute. We'll see lots of other birds, and we're going to get a little bit of a travelogue. Um, we're up in the northeasternmost corner of the United States. Uh, Cutler is one town below Lubeck, which is the northeasternmost color. Uh, the lighthouse in the northeasternmost part of the continent of the United States is named West Quaddy Light. I love the guy that named it. Man after my own. It turns out there's an East Quaddy Light on an island, so it actually makes sense. But it, yeah, when I was first looking at this, I was a little surprised to discover that the easternmost place was called West something. But we're going to see puffins. And. Okay, Atlantic puffins, the cute little birds made for photography. Uh, we've got razorbills. When I first heard of Machias Seal Island, well, I'll come back to that in a minute, but there's a um, common murs are also on the island. We'll also see Arctic terns and a flock of others. Oh. Let's start, uh, we'll start with the uh, the stats about puffins. We'll tell you more about puffins you wanted to know. And then I'll show you some of the things that we found. The uh, first couple times I went up, you have to go with a tour to get on the island. And getting away from my desk is a tricky part. So what I, what always scares me is getting rained on. So the first couple times I went, I got some insurance and I made reservations two days apart figuring that it's a rare storm in the summer in New England that will get me both days. And of course, once I paid the extra money, I got nice weather all four days. So we had to find some things to do to kill time in between. And there were actually some really interesting things. This is a neat corner in the United States. Um, these are turns. Did I get it? Oh, OK, yep. There's nothing like publishing. Uh, I, I, I've always said that the best spell checker in the world is publishing the newspaper. As soon as that hits the sand, somebody will tell you what you missed. Okay, but we're uh, sea parrots, clowns of the seas. Do we have birders? They're in the Alcidae family. They're related to ox. Um, they look like they should be related to penguins, but the... Uh, the MERS and the razor bills we saw uh, just a minute ago are closer relatives. They're smaller than I had expected. They're only about 80 inches tall standing up. All of it cute. They're about 10 inches long from the front of the bill to the tail. And their wings can get up to about two feet. Okay. They're seabirds. They live at sea and only come ashore to nest, to mate and nest. Um, they're going to eat small fish. Um, I, my, my knowledge of fish biology is from Hall's Pond in Newbury, you know. So uh, I, I have no idea what a sand eel is. I could probably spot a herring. Uh, Hake and Capelin are beyond me. But uh, if fish are scarce, they'll go for the crustaceans. The adults eat their meals at sea. But when they have chicks, they'll bring them ashore for the chicks. Here we see an inbound adult. The nests are down in burrows 
under the rocks. And so you don't get this much opportunity for this shot. The bird will land, look around, and dive down into the nest. But uh, their bills have a series of ridges on them, sort of like a letter sorter. So when they catch a fish, they put it in the back and go and catch the next one and stack it so they can hang on to it. And uh, you see a little better there. He was inbound for the, uh, for the burrow as well. Hey, where do they nest? They're going to either dig or reuse. If they can find a, find a burrow, there are thousands of puffins on Machias Seal Island. So there are lots of burrows already dug. So they probably are just picking up one that somebody abandoned. Uh, they may haul in dirt and twigs. They're going to lay only one egg. It's going to take 39 to 45 days to hatch. And they, uh, this is the first time I'd heard of uh, birds actually uh, controlling where they, where they use the bathroom. They have a, the burrow usually has a bend in it, and the chicks learn to use the bend. Okay. Now the, the pufflings, which is what they call the chicks, will stay in the burrow until they are ready to go to sea. And within a few minutes of coming out of the burrow for the first time, they leave the island not to return for a couple of years. Oops. The burrows aren't much to look at. Uh, just above his head there, that space between the rocks, that's all you see of the burrow. Uh, here's one other adult headed in. His burrow's hidden down below there. Um, they're the uh, University of New Brunswick and, oh, Atlantic Laboratory for Avian Research. I'm struggling to come up with the name of it, but uh, my notes have it. Uh, they have a professor or two and graduate students on the island doing various studies every summer. Um, one of the things they do is put cameras down in the nests. And this blue flag is marking a nest that's got a camera down in it so they can see what's going on. But they band a certain number of puffins every year. And when you grab it to band it, they probably take blood and weigh it and measure it. And, um, I'm not sure when the flags get up. Uh, um, they may have put the camera in years ago and just left it. I, I don't know. They're going to, uh, the, the birds will spend, they'll be back on the island um, late April, early May. They'll be gone by the first week of August, and they'll spend the rest of the year out at sea. Uh, when I first did this, there was a lot of question as to where they went. Uh, I've since seen research that they're just scattered across the uh, North Atlantic. Um, as we got smaller and smaller GPS transmitters, they could strap a GPS transmitter to the bird's leg and have it phone home regularly. Uh, we visited Machias Seal Island. We're up uh, this is this is a little awkward. <laughs> we'll come over here. Okay. We're uh, this is Maine, Portland's down here. We're all the way up. This is the Canadian border, okay, there's the Bay of Fundy, which I see a line of the little speck there. We'll get in a little closer in the next slide. Yeah, when you point out England, of course, that's where ours are, the, Northumberland. Yeah, okay. The east, that's what okay. I used to love watching them. Sorry, go ahead. Hey. So, the uh, fellow that's had the contract, uh, to take you out to the island, there's a fellow on the American side and a fellow on the uh, Canadian side that has a contract to take you. Um, the guy that had been doing it for 30 some odd years, unfortunately, passed last summer. It was a big part of the, uh, the show. He'd, over 35 years, he'd gotten to know how to entertain puffin watchers. But you go out of... Uh, Aren't there fish farms in that same area? I didn't see any fish farms, but there's a lot of fishing and a lot of... Uh, the, it, Cutler is a working harbor, uh, mostly lobstermen. 
Uh, I got a kick out of it between the uh, first and second time I went. Uh, most of the lobstermen had replaced their boats. And I asked our captain, he said, yeah, last year was a very good year for lobster. <laughs> and uh, they all just put it. This is a satellite photo of Machias Seal Island, that little red dot. It's about 15 acres at high tide. High point was about 27 feet. The Canadians, Machias Seal Island is contested territory between the United States and Canada. And the Can Canadians have, have occupied it since the early 1800s. And they're insistent on keeping Canadians on the island so that we don't sneak ashore and grab it. Um, they, uh, the Canadians run the lighthouse. I, I usually tell people that the island's protected by a large military presence. Well, large by Canadian standards. It's three guys. And they aren't military. They're Department of Transportation. They keep the lighthouse on. But their job is to, to keep uh, Canada's claim to the island. I don't know why we care. If they're, running, if they're paying for the lighthouse, it sounds like a good deal to me. It turns out when I was looking at the puffins on the west coast, there's an island off of uh, Washington state that's also claimed by Canada and disputed. And apparently there are two ways to settle who owns an island. Uh, one is you measure from the island to the nearest county seat and whoever is closest claims it. And the other is you take the population of the nearest county and you weight it and find the center of the population and the guy with the closest center of population gets it. And it turns out that each of these methods gives one of the islands to one country and the other island to the other. So they can't agree on which method to use. But so yeah, the Canadians, Canadians are out there. Um, this is the lighthouse. This is West Lubbock. This is the northeasternmost corner of the United States. Uh, this was the night before we went out. Um, if you've never seen the Bay of Fundy, it is worth going up to see. Silly me, I packed my kayak the first time. And I said, okay, there must be some place that I can. And this evening, watching the water rush out at 30 or 35 miles an hour, I, I said, well, let me just make sure that kayak is well secured to the truck. <laughs> so I stayed in a little campground up in the back, and they had a little pond in the center, and we had Mama duck and ducklings, so I had something to entertain myself for the evening. And you can't argue with ducklings. Ducklings are just too cute to ignore. Here's a little guy that spotted a bug well above his head. And he's going to get him. I went with two friends. One of us, uh, one of my friends and I split a, an apartment. Um, I, we were there for a better part of a week, and I, th I remember it costing me about 60 bucks for my share. And I was thinking that was a pretty good deal. Uh, my other buddy camped, and he was right next to the pond, and he really began to hit this guy. <laughs> Our bullfrog had something to say about most everything. Um, also driving around the back roads, we ran into mom and a calf. All right. we, uh, let's go back and look at the ocean here. Um, we went on our off day, we poked around for things to do, and they actually run whale watching tours out of Lubeck um, on a lobsterman, 37, 38 foot lobster boat. Um, and part of the pitch for the whale watching tours, where you get to go see the old Sal Whirlpool, where three channels come together in the Bay of Fundy. And I was thinking, okay, so um, I, I was not thrilled with that part of the agenda when I heard of it. But I was, it was actually fascinating to see, um, you know, several tens or hundreds of millions of tons of water coming together at different velocities. And it was, in fact, it's hard to show on the, the photos, but there were constantly whirlpools forming. And they would form and uh, you get a good funnel and then they'd dissipate and another one would pop up. And it, uh, it's very rough water and no place for a kayak. No, I didn't. Uh, but I, I got thinking that, you know, we're probably safe because, you know, our lobster, the captain was a lobster, the son of a lobsterman. And I said, you know, he learned to navigate this when he was in high school and he and his buddy swiped, a, you know, a case of beer and went out joyriding. So, you know, we're probably safe. But yeah, he did. Um, and 
along the way. There was a little uh, lighthouse. Um, lots of wildlife. And the, the captain of the whale watch was uh, very good. Uh, they were calling him Hollywood. He'd been interviewed by Good Morning America or somebody <laughs> recently, and his buddies weren't going to let him forget it. Uh, but he, he had enough dealings with tourists to know what we were looking for, and he slowed down for every eagle. And this is a minky whale. If you've never been whale watching, seeing a minky is fascinating. Um, for whales, they're relatively small. They're 38 or 40 feet. And they aren't very exciting when they dive. This is about all you see of them. They come up and they blow. Then as they dive, just their dorsal fin comes up. But if you've never seen one, it's fascinating. If you've been out and seen the humpbacks, you go, okay, it's a minky. Um, but we were up and there were lots of them around. Uh, coming very close in, a uh, couple got in to the boat much, much closer than my lens would let me focus. But you have your choice of uh, whale watching boats. We had the nice comfortable lobstermen. These guys were down closer to the whale, but I bet they got wet before they were home. And if you want to do it in style, they're out watching whales in this. And you can see we got a little shimmer in the uh, in the sky there already. And before we got home, it started getting socked in. Uh, and coming back, we actually, this is East Quaddy light, the light that I would have expected on the, on the shore, but what do I know? Um, okay, so how many puffins are on Machias Seal Island? When I first heard about it, I heard six to 8,000 puffins. Other estimates I've heard since then include four to 6,000, 8,000 to 10,000, over 10,000. Okay, so, you know, obviously I wasn't gonna drive all that way for 6,000 or 4,000 puffins. So, you know, I'm, I'm saying there were six. Uh, th there were many, many puffins. Okay, and there's also a big colony of razorbills. And depending on which researcher you ask, that colony is either slightly larger or slightly smaller than the puffin population, okay? So there are too many birds to count is what it comes down to. Uh, actually, on the last trip, I heard 8,000 parapuffins. Um, but as you approach the island, if you look on the top of the rocks, those are all little birds sticking up, and there are dozens of them in the air coming and going. It's loud. Uh, puffins have an odd call. To me, it sounds like a, a chainsaw, you know, working in the distance over a hill. Um, but with 5,000 puffins all saying, it, it's a noticeable noise. Um, as we got closer, you can see these look like mostly razor bills, but th this is what the, the, the island looks like in the summer. It's, okay. Now, I can show you all the birds, and I can tell you it was loud. What I can't share with you is a smell of 10,000 birds that have been there for, <laughs> for, uh, for decades, centuries. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's usually enough of a breeze, so it's not, it's livable. But uh, they put you in a little wooden blind. Uh, you only get an hour and 10 or 20 minutes. Um, but looking out of the blind, there are puffins everywhere you look. So. Uh, Let's look at how you get out there. This is Cutler Harbor. This is the first time I went. They've built a dock since then. Uh, but we got in, uh, that's uh, our crew getting on. You have to get into a skiff to go out to the lobster boat and they put you on the lobster boat and then they tow the skiff out to the island. And you have to get out of the lobster boat and into the skiff to get ashore. Um, apparently the captain's insurance agent has never ridden along with them. But, um, this is Cutler Harbor, uh, the evening before we went, nice, pretty mean looking harbor. Okay. This is uh, the Barbara Frost, named after the captain's mother. This is the boat that takes you to the island. Okay. And this is, the fellow standing up there is Andy Patterson. He was the captain for many years. Um, he. He had a shtick that he really played up the down east main hick, and he was so slick at it that I was sure he'd been to someplace like Wharton to learn it. Um, <laughs>
But yeah, no, he, he was uh, very good at giving you the down east main experience. Um, this is Cutler Harbor at low tide. This is the second time it was up. This is the, the dock that they use now. But you can see where the water goes up to. And this is outside the Bay of Fundy. So it's, um, here we are at relatively low tide as we're heading out. At the mouth of the harbor, there's the uh, uh, Little River Light, which is now a bed and breakfast. If you have the urge to go out and vacation at a lighthouse, these guys will be the ones to talk to. Uh, when you get out, I'm still on the lobster boat. Captain Andy has taken a uh, crew into the, into the island. There's a sunken concrete walkway. It was probably a boat launch at one point, but they pull into that and you hop out of the skiff and uh, see just how wet you can get your feet as you scramble ashore. But they get you ashore. Okay. And it takes two trips of the skiff to get everybody ashore and they keep you together. So while we were waiting for the second skiff to arrive, we had time to shoot and there are puffins coming and going. They're very fast flyers. And they're small, and they're agile, and just a little tweak of their wing, and they go off in a different direction. So they're very tough to find with a long lens. Uh, this is an Arctic tern. Uh, they're endangered. So there's a colony up here on the island. Uh, yeah, one of the things that the Canadians do uh, also is watch out for rats and mink, make sure nobody gets ashore for whatever reason. Um, they would be predators for the eggs and the chicks. But, uh, the Arctic tern also holds the record for the longest migration of any animal in the world. Uh, one particularly committed tern made the trip of, uh, they go from the Arctic Circle to the Antarctic Circle. One, uh, one that was outfitted with a tractor made the trip in nearly 60,000 miles, or about uh, twice the circumference of the planet. Here's a they fish by flying along and skimming the water for fish near the surface. Uh, he's just come up. Doesn't look like he was successful. Okay, there's one skimming looking for a fish. Okay. These are our razor bills. They're, I think they're handsome birds. They just chose their neighbors very poorly, so nobody pays much attention to them. But I think they got neat looking wraparound sunglasses. Okay. This is the common moor, moor or common guillemot, uh, depending on which generation of Audubon book you buy. Uh, there was a smaller population of these. They're a little smaller than the other two, but they're cute birds in their own right. They, plenty of opportunities to get all the birds flying around. And here's a puffin. You can see those bright orange feet dangling out behind them. And uh, yeah, this one was from, from the boat. It looks like the turtle looking down. Yeah, the, the boat sits up a couple of feet. Oh. And, it's, and there's, he's seen something below him. He's headed for the basement to find dinner. Is that one bird? Yeah. Oh, he's yeah, he's got his wing out. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> then we've got the Three swimming, apparently haven't heard of flying. I don't know anything. Yeah. Um, there were common eider on the, uh, and if you ever wondered why common eider had the coloring they did, whatever that seaweed is, is uh, exactly the reason. We've got a, a tern coming inbound. Now, terns are very protective of their territory, and they will attack what they view as potential predators, and they'll come down and whack you. Um, and they will go for the tallest person in line. So, you know, I had to be a little concerned about who I stood next to. But they, they also, uh, they, have a, they have a bunch of broomsticks that they painted white with a red stripe on it. And if you hold that up over the head, the bird will frequently go for that rather than your head. And you walk along and go, oh! <laughs> right. Okay, so we got the, we got, here's a puffin inbound with 
with a meal for the chicks. Chick, I guess is correct. Uh, here's a turn going by with a meal. And here's a turn once we got on shore. And we were fortunate. Here's, that's a turn chick that is, it's fledged, it's left the nest, but mom and dad are still feeding it. Okay, and while we were watching these, a gull appeared. And the terns were able to politely escort her from the premises. Uh, a broad wing gull? Uh, I'm not sure. I can't. It, you know, I'm, I'm not a very good birder. There are seagulls and little brown jobbies. You know, the, uh, the, the, the little sparrows, <laughs> I, I, I can spot several of them now, but, and actually I tell people, you know, I, I'd always enjoyed the outdoors, and one of the things that I, um, when I decided to get serious about nature photography, I was pretty confident that I could have named all six or seven sparrows that came through Vermont over the course of a year. Uh, Cornell University keeps eBird, their database, and I think they say that there's something like 28 that have appeared in the state over the last decade. <laughs> so yeah, um, but I, they're, they're cute little birds, and when I see an individual doing something, I'll photograph it. But I'm, there have been a handful of spox, fox sparrows, which are fairly rare, that have popped up in Vermont, New Hampshire. I'm not interested enough to go driving a couple hours to see a sparrow. There's little brown jobbies to me. The uh, blinds are over there on the, on the right of the, uh, the frame. They're just little wooden uh, boxes, two by four framed with plywood. Uh, they come in a couple of sizes. They're three sheets of plywood or four sheets of plywood wide, eight foot tall, and one piece of plywood deep, four feet deep. And they herd you out to them and lock you in. And they, they lecture you all the way. Don't, don't bother the birds, don't scare the birds. All the birds that are on that island now have been born after the tours have been coming and going day in and day out. So the birds know what's gonna happen. And they just sit there and watch you. Um, they just sit right on the, on the roof. In fact, you know, I, I swore that one of them was uh, asking everybody where he was from and you know, hey, I got an Arkansas over here. <laughs> you know, um, the birds are well aware that people go in the box open the window and click at them for an hour and then go away and we're no longer all that exciting. But uh, this is the blind next to us. I'm in the blind shooting out. But when you open the, they just cut little holes uh, and it's covered with a piece of, piece of plywood on a string. You pull the string and the piece of plywood slides up. You wrap the string around a nail and it stays up and you can stick your camera out the, uh, when you do, there are puffins everywhere. Can you they're, tell the male from the female? No, they're, oh, they're uh, the puffins can apparently, but uh, yeah. people can't. And you got, you got them sitting around on the rocks. And you can get a nice background with the, with the ocean. And they stand around. Okay. Sometimes they stand around in groups. Anybody get Birds and Blooms magazine? No, nope, no, nope, okay. No, nope, they ran that a while back. And, and there's not a heck of a lot of room to get away from puffins at the peak of the season. But yeah, I'm sure it's a in you know, the flocking is a, a safety mechanism too. They and they stretch their wings. They spend their time sitting or standing, preening, stretching. Or and They'll, they'll stretch and shake their wings. That, uh, that stretching is like yawning. It's contagious. This guy stretches. His buddy answers. <laughs> and these two are just standing there. This guy needed a stretch. And then his buddy followed. And then they're But that, that they, after they come back on a nice day, they'll be out drying. Um, th this looks like a stretch, and when they shake them, they're probably realigning their feathers. But yeah, they, they will 
they will perch like other birds and dry their wings. Um, this, this guy looks a little baffled because they were both stretching at the same time. But, uh, oh, wait. Another stretch. And they also spend a lot of time preening. They have to clean every feather every day. And like other water birds, they've got a gland at the base of their tail that secretes a wax-like substance. Um, and that's what keeps their feathers waterproof. So you'll see them reaching around to rub their head against the base of their tail. And then they rub all over their body to spread the, the, uh, the waxy stuff. Um, and here's one. He's, I missed him getting the tail, apparently, but he's got got the waxy stuff on his head and he's spreading it over his feathers. Then they go through and they'll take every feather and they'll run it through their bill to clean it. Um, it's a job. But it, it makes you think you've gotten your puffins from Ikea. There's, they're all rubbing and this one's cleaning feathers under his, on his breast there under his wing on his back. Now when they're going around, getting around on the island, if they're only going a short distance, they waddle a little bit and going from rock to rock, it's a little leap. Wings out for balance. We're going uphill, I think, there. Here's one coming in for a landing, I think. He's coming in for and he's, and You can see that he's banded. There are a fair number of banded birds on the island, um, and every year they add to it. And, and then here's one heading out. There he goes. He's banded as well. When they come in, if you're lucky, they'll come in and they'll make a nice gentle arc and slow down so you can track them with the camera. Uh, I found that it's best to work with a buddy and working with a long lens. I only see like a you know, 1.4 degree angle. It's very tough to pick up on a small subject at a distance. But working with a buddy, they call out, you know, you got one high at 2 o'clock and you start looking that way. And, um, but yeah, we were able to get a bunch in flight. Here's one. I think he's hopping between rocks or he may be coming in for a landing. Okay, and then when they're not preening, hopping, or standing, they squawk. <laughs> and in the blind that they see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're in the box looking out. And if you're not in the blind, they don't get close enough. They they won't let you on the island unless they put you in the blind. Just not to disturb the puppy? Yeah. They uh that's part of the tour responsibility. They, they actually hand you off to the graduate students, and the graduate students escort you out, put you in the box. And, well, I, I didn't try. <laughs> but yeah, they go away. They, have to, uh, uh, they leave you until it's time to round everybody up, and then they herd everybody back. Um, and they squawk. And this guy's banded on both legs. I don't know why. Uh, um, on loons, they band both legs. Uh, these bands have numbers. Uh, the uh, U.S. Geologic Survey, I think, is actually the keeper of the database. Um, but those have a number. The problem with the number is you have to be holding the bird to read it. They're little tiny numbers. So uh, to get around that on the loons, they actually give them four bands. One's the silver band with the number. And then they mix up. They have uh, different colored bands. And uh, one of the loons that I follow uh, the Easton's on my blog, uh, Dad is banded, and he's got a black band with a yellow dot on it. So that you can tell, once you can see all four bands, we didn't have to catch him to know which one he was. When I got uh, pictures of both legs, I was able to contact the Loon Preservation Committee, and they said, oh yeah, we tagged him in uh, 2015 in Morton, New Hampshire. But yeah, the puffins uh, squawk. I, I carried a very, very long lens with me. Turns out this was overkill, but uh, this guy's tonsils checked out, so we're... <laughs> uh, here's a puffin with a razor bill. The razor bills are a little bigger, 
and that white stripe that uh, sets off the rise. It's a, I think they're handsome birds, but that they just don't hold up next to the puffins. Um, but there are a lot of these on the island as well. And guess what? They stretch. <laughs> And here's one returning with a fish for his chicks. And it looks like he's telling the others, oh, you should have seen the yellow one. <laughs> the, these guys rest for a couple of seconds longer than the puffins coming in, but still it's just a matter of seconds between landing with a fish and disappearing down the burrow. And this guy's banded as well. And here he is hopping between rocks. And this one, if you can see the top of his bill there, you see the little spikes hanging down? That's how they hang on to the fish so they can catch multiple fish to come in. And these two were, I think these two were a mated pair, a bonded pair. And uh, we, we had to yell at them to get a rum, but they were preening each other. And here's somebody that's objecting. It's hard to tell what birds are arguing about. Um, and these two were upset about something. And it, they let each other know. There's another shot of their, of their face. The other uh, group, smaller than the uh, razorbills and the puffins, but there's a good sized colony of common murs on the island. And they're it, water birds all have the same pattern. They're all light on the bottom and dark on the back. So that if you're looking up at them, they blend with the sky. And if you're looking down, they blend with the water. And here's a mer. And guess what? Mer stretch. I think this guy wants a career as an umpire, baseball umpire. But and mer's also squawk. So there's plenty of opportunity to get all the species of birds flying. Uh, this one's coming in. He's slowing for a landing. And here are a couple of murs going by. Okay, back to our puffins. Uh, you can get very close shots of the puffins. Yeah. And uh, here's one. This one's interesting for a couple. You can see the band. You can actually read one of the numbers on there, but they're wasn't enough to identify the bird. But look at the claws. That's what they're using for the digging. Catching fish, no, they, they, they get the fish with the bill. Yeah, with the bill, yeah. Yeah, so it's, okay, here our puffins are discussing something. Now, if all you have is wings and a bill, you use them for a lot of communication. And here, th this appeared to be a bonded pair. One of them flew in. And they greeted each other, they bowed and rubbed their bills back and forth. And they were, they were working at it. But, um, this guy came over and objected. And the same general motion, but the, with, yeah, you could see it was more aggressive. It wasn't a gentle move anymore. And they, these two would go at it. Okay. And all they have is a bill, so they're going to use the bill to make the point. And, oh, got your nose. <laughs> this guy, uh, the uh, guy on top there, he's got the, and he's pushing the uh, other one down. And that was enough to settle the fight. One last squawk. One last push, and then this guy went back, the uh, guy doing the push, and went back to the one that he'd been greeting. And now we've got another one coming in. He's just landed. This is where he's shaking the water off his wings. Okay, we got good shots of them. Yeah. Lots of opportunities for shots of both the individual birds and for groups. And this one's 
This one's sizing up the leap. There he goes. There. This fellow was kind enough to come over and offer us a, a stick. <laughs> yeah, I think he was taking it in to work on the nest, but he came over and had a look at us with it. And here we have a couple of the puffins stocking things over. Okay, now there's another section of the, the island. Um, they say it's the same island. It's separated by a, I don't know, a quarter or a third of a mile of water um, at low tide. But when at low tide, the rocks come out and they call it seal rock. And the reason they call it seal rock, because they're seals. <laughs> okay, and they, uh, the, on a nice day when the water is relatively calm, and, it, and it's not foggy so you can see. The captain uh, would take you around. You couldn't land on Seal Rock, but he, he went uh, puttering around slowly so we could get a good look at, a, at the seals. The seals, uh, they're uh, two different types. They're harbor and gray. This is a gray. Um, and they come in lots and lots of colors. And this poor guy, he, he looks like he's got a nice spot to bask for the afternoon. Well. No. It's the ocean. This, they're cute little guys. Um, we were, we were uh, relatively close for a boat, I don't know, uh, 200 feet maybe, and you could smell the fish breath. <laughs> they uh, have a definite fish breath, but lots of different colors. This little guy was kind enough to give us a wave. And seals are easily contented, just a nice comfy rock to rest your head. And different color. Is that really a blue? Is it lost or is that? He's got some blue in him, yeah. He's, they, uh, yeah, now that looks like real good camouflage to me for uh, surf. And I, I was a little surprised at the variation in the, the color of the seals. You would have thought they'd have found a coloration that works best, but this guy looks contented. And we found a redhead. And we've got a He's headed back to the water, waves coming up behind him. And then it was time to head back to port, and our <laughs> puffin had had enough of us. Well, that's what you see if you go up to Machias Seal Island and visit the puffins. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay. Thanks.